Medicine at the University of Washington and a member at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, and I'll be the moderator for this program. Uh, so welcome to the 2011 ASH Annual Meeting Press Conference on Transplantation, entitled Improving Recovery and Survival Strategies for Patients Who Undergo Transplantation. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind you all to please uh, turn off your cell phones and pagers. Um, to ensure that we have plenty of time for all of the presentations, we ask that you hold your questions until the end. And after all of the presentations, we will open the floor to questions, um, and then finally the phone lines to allow those who are calling in uh, to also ask their questions. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the four abstracts that you're going to hear about today. Um, we'll begin with Dr. Claudio Anasetti, uh, who will discuss a new study revealing that peripheral blood uh, stem cell transplants from unrelated donors are associated with higher rates of chronic graft-versus-host disease um, and have no survival advantage when compared with transplants using stem cells uh, taken from bone marrow. And the details for this abstract can be found in number one. Uh, our next uh, presentation will be by Drs. Kanlan Sun and Smita Badia, who will be discuss their research, concluding that long-term survivors who are 10 or more years after their transplant, um, when compared to their siblings, have a higher rate of psychological uh, and chronic health conditions, including heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, subsequent cancers, and long-term generalized pain or discomfort, referred to as somatic distress. And study details uh, for this can be found in uh, abstract number 841. Our third presentation will be by Dr. Arnab Ghosh, who will discuss uh, his team's recent discovery of a method of using genetically engineered T cells to help the body kill cancer cells more effectively without causing a uh, graft versus host disease. And this study is outlined in abstract 817. And finally, Dr. Scott Solomon will discuss a study suggesting that a novel preparatory regimen prior to haploidentical uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation may improve outcomes in patients with high-risk blood cancers who lack a matched uh, donor. And this abstract number is 889. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Dr. Anasetti to give our first presentation. And uh, Claudia, please remember to speak into the microphone so that all the people on the uh, phone lines can hear us. The first uh, question I've been asked to address is what are the reasons why we choose to conduct this research? So I'll give you a minimal amount of background uh, so that everybody's not uh, tuned into this area and be able to understand. Marrow transplants were first established uh, for the treatment of leukemia with work from the 60s through the 80s, and uh, Don Thomas was given the Nobel Prize for that in 1990. Right at that time, it was understood the stem cells, blood-forming stem cells, circulate in the bloodstream. And that was immediately followed by a very rapid change in the technology for use of autologous uh, source of cells from bone marrow to peripheral blood stem cells that actually improved enormously the ability of conducting those procedures. The problem with those peripheral blood stem cells was that they contain about 20 to 50 times more T cells that cause the graft versus host disease. So in allogeneic transplant from HLA identical siblings, they, develop, they were developed very, very cautiously. First, there were pilot studies that uh, showed feasibility, and then not, actually 12 randomized clinical trials were performed. And a meta-analysis analyzed 12 of those trials uh, that were the most homogeneous, and concluded that uh, PBSC were associated with uh, much uh, faster engraftment, um, um, a little bit more graft, acute graft versus host disease, more chronic graft versus host disease. Those were the, the graft versus host disease was a problem, but the bonus was actually that relapse was less and that survival was improved, especially in patients that have high risk disease. Other studies, uh, another prospective control study has shown that actually PBC are better in, in improving um, outcome survival in CML. Um, at that point, we started to develop uh, the peripheral blood stem cells in unrelated donor transplant, and uh, a, a single arm phase two was conducted. In order to understand uh, whether it was working well or not, was compared to uh, concurrent control that we're receiving bone marrow. That was not randomized. And that suggested, actually, that the benefits uh, that seen in the siblings were not there. But we were concerned that there was bias of allocation. In the retrospective studies, you're never sure whether the groups are comparable. So we designed these prospective trials that I'm going to present tomorrow at 2 o'clock. 
And so the findings, we confirmed that PBSC from unrelated donor for unrelated donors associated with uh, faster engraftment, higher probability of keeping the graft. Uh, um, acute graft resource disease is just about the same, but chronic was increased. More of the chronic was the form that is called extensive. 16% more patients had the chronic extensive form. Um, unfortunately, the bad news was that relapse was now less and survival was the same. In any subset of patients uh, that, were, um, uh, that we had pre-planned to look at. And so um, at this point, uh, the, 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 the other question is, uh, how do we, what's the impact of this uh, study? Well, first of all, you know, nowadays, uh, more patients get unrelated donor transplant than siblings, just because it's so much easier to find a match unrelated donor than a sibling match by at least two to one. And, uh, and so this has really impact. And the question is based on these uh, results is why would anyone want to have a 16% increase in the chance of living with chronic GVHD for years? For example, at two years, 20% more patients that are alive uh, after a PBSC transplant are on immune suppression compared to bone marrow. And uh, so what we could say is that there are going to be some patients that may still benefit from peripheral blood over bone marrow, and those are patients that are at increased risk of graft rejection, and that's because uh, the, the, the marrow graft was associated with more graft rejection by 8% uh, in terms of mortality compared to the, the, the PBSC that was zero. So patients at risk of graft rejection didn't get immune suppression before transplant, uh, like MDS, could probably benefit more from PBSC. Or other patients that have gotten so much chemotherapy before transplant that now have systemic infections, they need rapid reconstitution with uh, blood cells and to clear those infections and survive in the short term those may benefit still from PBSC. Others probably do better with bone marrow. We don't yet have uh, a decision analysis on these or other data sets to so identify subset of patients who benefit from one, from, uh, from one or the other. What is the caveat of this study? Is that was done with myeloablative conditioning regimen, so super lethal conditioning that unless you get a transplant, you would die. And uh, those uh, were almost 100% at the time the study was started, it's about 50% now. So for those 40% that received very much reduced intensity conditioning, this study may not be um, applicable as uh, currently shown. Uh, the next step, well, um, obviously for bone marrow transplant recipients, we should continue the study how to minimize uh, graft failure. Uh, that it's a battle we've been working for many years, and uh, it's uphill. But if you look at the causes of death that you m will see tomorrow on the presentation, you see that still the number one cause of death in both marrow and PBSC transplant recipients, the largest cause is still graft versus disease. And obviously, both acute and graft chronic graft versus disease in peripheral blood stem cells is an issue. So one option for future studies is to focus on, on PBSC recipients and study approaches to prevent both acute and chronic graft versus host disease. Thank you, Dr. Anasetti. Uh, Dr. Sun, you're going to present our next abstract. So good morning. My name is Ken Lan Sun. On behalf of the research team, I, give, I will give you a brief overview of our study that is focusing on the burden of morbidity in hematopoietic cell transplant recipients who have survived at least 10 years. We all are aware that advances in transplantation techniques and the supportive care strategies have resulted in a significant improvement in survival. As the number of long-term survivors is growing, increasing attention is now being focused on their health status and psychological well-being. Previously, we have shown that HCT survivors who have survived two or more years are at increased risk of developing a wide range of chronic health conditions and adverse psychological problems. However, there is a lack of information regarding the burden of morbidity and psychological health 
among HCT recipients who have survived for an extended length of time, such as those who have survived 10 or more years. In addition, there is a paucity of information regards to the healthcare utilization by these long-term survivors. So using a retrospective cohort study design, this study addresses these questions in the literature. A total of 366 10 plus year survivors and 309 siblings participated in this study. The median follow up is 14 years ranging from 10 to 28 years. 27% of the patients received autologous HCT, 73% had undergone an allogeneic transplant. The large majority of the patients had received TBI based conditioning in combination with cyclophosphamide or etoposide or both. In terms of primary diagnosis, 62% of the patients had received HCT for acute or chronic leukemia, 18% for Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the remainder for aplastic anemia and other miscellaneous diagnosis. So in this study, we observed that survivors were more likely to report have any chronic health condition comparing to siblings. 74% of the survivors reported having any chronic health condition. The comparable figures in the siblings was 39%. The difference was especially prominent for severe or life-threatening conditions. 25% of the survivors versus 8% of the siblings reported having severe life-threatening conditions. In terms of relative risk, survivors were five times more likely than siblings to report severe life-threatening conditions. At 15 years post-transplant, the cumulative incidence of any chronic health condition in survivors reached 71%, and the cumulative incidence of severe life-threatening condition or death due to chronic health condition reached 40%. Among HCT survivors, those who exposed to TBI and with health insurance were more likely to report severe life-threatening conditions. As for psychological outcomes, survivors were not different from the siblings in terms of reporting anxiety, depression, and global distress. However, even after 10 years post-transplant, survivors were still significantly more likely to report somatic distress. 11% of the survivors reported somatic distress compared to 4% of the siblings. So survivors were 2.7 times more likely than their siblings to report somatic distress. Among survivors, female, those with low income, and those with poor health status were more likely to report somatic distress. 90% of our long-term survivors reported that they had health insurance coverage. With respect to healthcare utilization, all of the survivors reported making contact with medical providers within the past two years. 78% of them have received a general physical examination, and nearly two-thirds of them reported returning to the cancer center for ongoing care. So in conclusion, as HCT continues to be a curative option for a variety of hematological malignancies, the burden of long-term physical and emotional mobility borne by HCT recipients who have survived at least 10 years is substantial. Even 10 years after transplant, these survivors continue to have a high utilization of specialized healthcare services. So patients, families, and healthcare providers need to be made aware of this high burden so that they can plan for post-HCT care even many years after transplantation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sun. And Dr. Ghosh? Hi, I'm um, Dr. Ghosh from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I'm part of a team which is directed by Dr. Marcel Fandenbrink, uh, who work to make allogenic bone marrow transplant an effective and a safer form of therapy. So uh, what I'm going to present here is a study which is uh, performed in the lab, an experimental study, and uh, where we show that it's possible to perhaps uh, make it more effective, uh, make the allo-BMT more effective 
and uh, safer. So as Dr. Anasetti just talked about, in many blood cancers, allogenic bone marrow transplantation represents the only treatment with potential for cure. And in this form of therapy, the recipient's immune system is replaced by that of donor's immune reconstituting cells. And as Dr. Anasetti just to told, that Graft versus host disease remains a major cause of death and severe morbidity. The primary cause of Graft versus host disease is linked to the donor's white blood cells, especially a subset that's known as donor T cells, which can recognize the host cells and attack it indiscriminately, targeting normal tissues as well as cancer cells. So much of our research is focused on how we can make the T cells not kill indiscriminately the normal tissues, but at the same time retain its ability to kill cancer cells. So our, the way we decided to approach this problem was to introduce a gene into the donor T cells which would make them better killers. So adding genetical, uh, genetically engineered donor T cells is a promising new strategy and many of the clinical trials that are currently going on has been using this strategy, and they have introduced genes which make the T cells able to target tumor cells specifically, and therefore enhancing their recognition and killing. However, not all tumor cells can be distinguished that easily, because many of them look identical to normal tissues. So what we did was to try an option where the T cells would be essentially better killers. So use, uh, we developed a vector which was derived from parts of HIV which, uh, which are effective in transducing these donor T cells, and then introduced in this ve vector the, uh, the transgenic virus, if you will, uh, in, uh, a, a gene that expresses a molecule known as TRAIL. And TRAIL is one of the molecules that uh, the T cells use to kill cancer cells. And almost a decade back, work done in Dr. Fannerbrink's lab had shown that while this molecule was very effective in killing cancer cells, T cells did not use this molecule to cause graft versus host disease. So we hypothesized that if you could make the T cells effective cancer killers, perhaps you could reduce the dose and therefore get a better anti-tumor effect without GVHD. So we introduced these T cells in our experimental models of bone marrow transplantation where the mice, uh, it was a murine model and the mouse had tumors in them. And the tumors would kill the mouse very quickly, 20 to 30 days. And if you treated them with controlled T cells, like un uh, untransduced uh, T cells, there you would get some benefit, that is some of the mice would survive, but many of the mice would die either out of cancer or out of graft versus host disease. We compared these with mice which were treated with trail-expressing T cells, the T cells that we genetically engineered, and we found that while none of the mice actually died out of tumor, unexpectedly none of the mice died of uh, graft versus host disease as well. So we investigated this further, and we tried testing this in a model which did not have tumors, just uh, a graft versus host disease model, and we found in, in different types of models, a haploidentical model where a parent type of bone marrow is introduced into the offspring, or a completely mismatched model. And what we found was that in all these models, the T trail positive T cells did not increase the graft versus host disease, and we found evidence that in fact it was able to suppress graft versus host disease. Further investigations from our study shows that the T cells the trail positive T cells are not only effective in killing the cancer cells, they also are effective in suppressing immune cells which cause graft versus host disease. Changing gears a little, we, found, we, we realized that one limitation of cell therapies with especially donor T cells is the requirement of immunological matching. Otherwise, there is a very high chance of either rejection or graft versus host disease. So to do away with this requirement, we decided to use progenitors of T cells. A body of work from uh, our group had shown that 
it was possible to use T-cell progenitors uh, because they would undergo tolerization in the body and therefore not cause graft versus host disease and at the same time enhancing the engraftment of the, tra of the grafted cells. So we put trail in these uh, T-cell progenitors and actually manufactured these progenitors in a dish in the lab laboratory and used this to treat mice with tumors and the mice were transplanted with autologous bone marrow that is not allogenic, that is not from some other strain of mice, but from its own type of bone marrow. So this shows that we were able to, uh, and in these mice, while a significant number of mice uh, had large kidney cancers, the, the tumor model that we selected, uh, while a significant number of mice had large kidney cancers in those which were not treated with trail-positive T-cells, we found smaller tumors and less mice with tumors in those, uh, in those which were treated with trail-positive T-cell progenitors. So essentially this um, shows that it's possible to use cell therapy without the requirement of matching. So overall, our study shows that one, we were, it's possible to simultaneously protect uh, against relapse and prevent graft versus host disease. And further, we show that cell therapy with trail expressing T cell progenitors can be effective in treating certain cancers without the requirement of matching, thus as an off-the-shelf cell uh, therapy. Of course, these are experimental models, they are preclinical models, but these form a groundwork for future trials possibly with these kind of cells. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Dr. Solomon, would you like to finish up? So in, in the first uh, two presentations, uh, you sort of heard about some of the long-term uh, problems associated with transplant, but I think it's important to remember, again, that this represents the uh, best and perhaps only curative option for a lot of patients with high-risk uh, blood cancers. And, for patients that, that require an allogeneic transplant, we typically want to find them a HLA-matched donor. In uh, approximately 30% of our patients, they can find a matched sibling donor. Another 30 to 40% of patients uh, can find a donor in the volunteer registry, uh, although this takes some time, and not all of our patients have, have the luxury of time uh, to wait. Um, and, and in minority communities, this, uh, they have a much lower chance of finding donors in the, in the uh, volunteer registry. Uh, but clearly there's a lot of patients out there that could benefit from an allogeneic transplant and don't have access to a matched uh, donor. And in that situation, um, other strategies need to be used and, and um, a, uh, one, one source of donors would be a partially matched family member or what we call a haploidentical donor. And this is a very attractive option because most everybody has a haploidentical donor. This could be a parent, this could be a child uh, or a haploidentical sibling. And uh, we can have rapid access to these donors. They don't have to wait um, as they do uh, for donors from the registry. And historically, these, these uh, transplants have been very difficult to perform. If we use standard transplant techniques, the rates of graft versus host disease is very, very high, prohibitively high. Um, um, but more recently, um, uh, several strategies have, have really brought haploidentical transplant to the forefront. Um, well, one such strategy, uh, it's, uh, the uh, Italians have, have popularized is using uh, stringent uh, T-cell depletion techniques, so removing all, uh, most of the immune cells from the graft prior to transplant, uh, and then using very high-intensity uh, therapy in order to get these transplants in, and that's been very successful as far as um, uh, reducing graft-versus-host disease, um, good anti-leukemic control. And the problem tends in those transplants to be uh, immune recovery and, and infectious complications. Um, and then another strategy which has been uh, sort of developed by the Johns Hopkins group, um, which our study is trying to piggyback on top of, is, is a different strategy. They use uh, a um, low intensity regimen. Um, they use unmanipulated bone marrow graft, so, so a T-cell replete uh, bone marrow graft and then they um, give a common chemotherapy medication called cyclophosphamide or cytoxan after the transplant in addition to other post-transplant immunosuppressives. Um, and they've shown very successfully that you can um, 
uh, get these transplants to take. The rates of graft versus host disease is low. Infections are actually uh, surprisingly low in these transplants. Uh, and the major problem tends to be relapse and, and high-risk malignancies. And, and that's a major source of treatment failure for many uh, low-intensity or non-myeloblative uh, transplant approaches. So we, we've tried to attempt to uh, improve the outcomes um, in patients at perceived high risk uh, of relapse um, by utilizing this post-transplant cyclophosphamide, using a myeloablative or full-intensity uh, preparative regimen, and an unmanipulated uh, peripheral blood stem cell infusion. So, you know, the, the two things, uh, two items that we're using to try to improve the outcomes is one, uh, an intensive busulfan-based preparative regimen, and two, utilizing peripheral blood stem cells instead of bone marrow as our stem cell source, which um, uh, data suggests may have a better anti-leukemic um, activity. Um, although at risk for maybe perhaps more GVHD, as Dr. Anasetti alluded to. So between uh, January 2009 and March 2011, we, we did a phase two pilot study where we uh, took 20 patients uh, at perceived high risk for uh, relapse. These 55% uh, of these patients had relapsed refractory disease, and 45% of these patients had what we consider standard risk disease. So these patients were mostly uh, leukemia patients that were in remission but had high-risk biological features. Um, in this study, um, engraftment uh, was seen in all, all 20 patients uh, promptly. Acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease uh, occurred in 30% and 42% of the patients, respectively, which is uh, what we would expect with a matched related uh, donor uh, transplant. Non-relapse mortality was seen in 10% of patients at one year, uh, which is very respectable. Um, and uh, in our standard risk patients that were in remission at the time of transplant, uh, the non relapse mortality was, was zero. And the corresponding uh, survival at one year was 74% for the whole group and 100% uh, for the, the patients in, with standard risk disease. As far as toxicity, um, we did see a viral cystitis in a, um, in a higher than expected frequency, about three quarters of the patients, although this was not a life-threatening complication. It does um, have morbidity for our patients. Uh, but other infections were, were not seen at increased frequency um, compared to other uh, ablative transplants done at our institution. And um, our conclusions from this study were that uh, myeloablative haploidentical transplants using unmanipulated uh, peripheral blood stem cells and post-transplant cytoxan is, is feasible. Uh, we saw promising rates of engraftment GVHD non-relapse mortality and disease-free survival, and that this is certainly a valid option uh, in patients uh, with high-risk malignancies who lack timely access to a conventional donor. Um, and future studies are sort of building on this work. We want to treat more patients um, and better define the, both the safety and efficacy of, of this approach.